A deranged person is sitting in a cell at the Mobile County Jail, his mind consumed by recollections of the innocent ladies he has abducted. He whispers to himself, one, two, three, she was carrying a child, four, but the real number of victims is buried deep in his mind. A dark secret, five, six, seven, he murmurs, his eyes cold and empty. He extends his hand, fingers spread wide, savoring the memories of the lives he has taken. Let's start with this one, he adds, pointing to his index finger, the memory of his first murder still fresh in his mind. Joel Patrick Lewis was born in 1965, and experienced a difficult childhood as a result of his family frequently moving between Atlanta and the Boston suburb of Brockton. Joel's parents separated when he was 11 years old, and the child immediately began to dabble in minor crimes. Lewis's twisted mind was clear from an early age, as he demonstrated the telltale traits of a potential serial killer, including a desire to start fires, a history of persistent bedwetting, and a terrible propensity for torturing animals. His family is all too aware of the crimes he did when he was just four years old. When screams rang through the house as Lewis was downstairs alone playing with matches while his family slept, it was him who had dropped a match on his own pajamas, setting himself ablaze and leaving scars that would mark him for the rest of his life. Despite this traumatic experience, Lewis's twisted desires were unabated. Lewis was standing in his bedroom with the lights off, a knife in his hand, and stated, I remember thinking I could pop this in and out very quick and I wouldn't even feel it, but I didn't have the guts to do it. The depravity of Lewis knew no bounds as he not only set fire to structures, but also took pleasure in tormenting and killing innocent animals. He boasted about setting fire to a dog house trapping the family dog inside, but when it miraculously managed to escape, he found a new way to satisfy his sadistic tendencies. As Lewis got older, his obsession with fire only grew, setting ablaze not only woods, but also apartment complexes without fear or remorse. He would take white milk jugs, cut the tops off, and slit them over the heads of unwary canines, rendering them blind, before abandoning them on the road to be hit by passing cars. The instant that one match slipped from his grasp, it burned away not just his youthful innocence, but also any remaining semblance of humanity he might have had. He took delight in the fact that one of the dogs he tortured in such a way was his own. Gerald eventually succeeded in landing work, but he was unable to keep it for very long. But he kept reverting to burglary and he was amassing a substantial criminal record. But he didn't start investigating murder until 1986. Although he tried to leave his criminal past behind, as he got older, he was drawn to a life of crime starting with minor offenses before moving on to more serious crimes like burglary. His record grew longer and longer with each passing year, but it wasn't until 1986 that he fully accepted the darkness inside of him and started to commit the ultimate act of evil. In 1986, just before Christmas, Lewis sat alone in his van, scanning the streets for potential prey. He carefully clutched his hunting knife, keeping the blade concealed between the flaps of his wallet for easy access. Lena Santarpio, his ex-girlfriend, had left him not long before she became severely pregnant with his child. Her parents did not like him, so they persuaded Lena to leave him and raise the child alone. Following Lena all day, Lewis watched as she left her parents' house with her father and followed them to a relative's house. Lewis pulled over and waited for her to leave, but as the hours passed and she did not, Lewis's frustration turned to rage. 
The town's holiday decorations only served to fuel his resentment of the festive season. When he saw a young woman walking along the roadside with the same brown hair and dark eyes as Lena, he slowed down his van, his heart leaping at the possibility that it was her. However, as she turned to face him, he realized it was not. It was just another lost soul caught in the same web of despair he was looking for. As he made his way to the town square, his thoughts were consumed with Lena and the child he had been denied. You're trying to find a ride, he said, yeah, you're looking for a girl, to which she replied, I'm a street worker. As she got into the van, he pulled over and pressed play on the tape player, filling the air with holding back the years by simply read, the song that had once been his and Lena's song but was now just a cruel reminder of what they had lost. As he drove, he sang along, his voice hollow as he planned his next move. He drove for 15 miles before stopping behind a gravel pit. He forced her out of the van and they strolled into the woods. She begged him not to take what he wanted from her, but he persisted. Her screams during the tort echoed through the trees. He rapidly unhealed the knife with his right hand. He then put the blade on her neck, forcing her head down between her knees. He locked her left hand under his thigh. He stabbed her another 30 or 40 times until his arm ached, leaving her there covered in blood and dirt, dragging some wood over her in a feeble attempt to hide the body before walking back to the van, getting in, pressing play, and simply red once more filled the air. He had struggled her and forced himself on her remains. After this, he became even more insane, slicing open her stomach in a twisted search for his unborn child. In 1987, he also broke into an apartment and nearly strangled a five-year-old Stephanie to death, leading to his arrest and conviction for attempted murder. Peggy Lynn Grimes, a Georgia resident who was eight months pregnant at the time of her disappearance in 1993, was Joel's next known victim. Despite the fact that Peggy's mother reported her missing in September 1993, it took the police five years to find and identify the victim's body. Authorities did not know anything about Gerald, though, and only after Kathleen Bracken's death in April 1998 were they able to start following him. Police were alerted to a probable murder in April 1998, after receiving a panic 911 call from the Twilight Motel in Mobile, Alabama. When emergency personnel arrived on the scene, they discovered Kathleen unresponsive and covered in blood in her motel room. She was asphyxiated and stabbed to death, according to an autopsy. And a medical evaluation also revealed that she had been sexually abused and raped. Intriguingly, Witnesses at the Twilight Motel reported that a man driving a red pickup truck had gone nearby to visit Kathleen that day. As a result, the police started actively following that lead. In an effort to find a more conclusive lead, law enforcement agents started looking into Kathleen's friends because she made a profession as a prostitute. They then came across a young woman named Lisa, who insisted that a man driving a red pickup truck had hired her that very night. Authorities created a lifelike sketch of the suspect using Lisa's description, and Gerald Patrick Lewis was quickly identified. On the other hand, Gerald's DNA was perfectly matched by a sample the police were able to take from a cigarette but in Kathleen's room. Surprisingly, when confronted with the facts, Gerald instantly admitted to killing Kathleen and even told police about further murders that weren't related to him. In addition to Peggy Grimes, he also admitted to killing Misty McGugin in January 1998 and three other women in Georgia. Gerald Patrick Lewis passed away in 2009, 
therefore he is no longer among us. Gerald entered a plea of guilty after being presented in court to a variety of offenses, including feticide, criminal murder, aggravated violence, and keeping with bodily harm. Gerald was given life in prison without the possibility of parole for the murder of Kathleen Bracken, but the jury found sufficient evidence to support their claim of aggravating circumstances and sentenced Gerald to death for the 2003 murder of Misty McGugin. Additionally, during the course of the trial, the accused even admitted to killing two Georgia women, Peggy Grimes and an unnamed prostitute. But according to the records, Gerald was still incarcerated and on death row when he suddenly passed away on July 25, 2009.